In June of this year, San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Budin was recalled, which was a major blow to criminal uh, justice reform advocates and abolitionists alike. Our next guest, Ben Spielberg, co-founder of 34 Justice and Leighton Woodhouse, journalist and documentarist, join us to discuss what happened in San Francisco. Welcome to you both. Thanks so Thank much for having us. So I wanted to talk to you both on this show, in part because you were engaged in what I thought was one of the more productive and respectful conversations that have been happening online and which have been happening and I think increasing volume even within the left. So I'll start with you, Leighton. What in your view is the problem here? Where has the left gone wrong from your perspective in its advocacy for certain kinds of criminal justice reform initiatives? Well, in San Francisco specifically, I think everybody knows by now that there's a massive homeless problem and that's connected to um, a huge crime problem. That crime problem is um, open drug dealing in the Tenderloin neighborhood, which is sort of um, San Francisco's equivalent of a skid row, um, which is a 30 square block area downtown, which is in just an open drug market. There are hundreds at any given time of drug dealers on the street openly selling meth, fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, whatever else you need, um, whatever else you can think of. And there's a massive uh, a street addict population um, who are people who are suffering, um, suffering acutely. Um, you walk through the Tenderloin and there's no denying it. Um, and I think where the left has gone wrong is by seeing this as principally a um, housing issue, an issue of housing prices. Now, there is a housing crisis in California and in the Bay Area in particular. Housing costs are out of control, but the people who are living on the streets in tents, that is not their problem. It's certainly not their main problem. Um, even if rents were affordable, these are folks who are acutely addicted to very hard drugs, um, and they are forced to live on the street because they can't live more than a couple of blocks from, they can't stay a, more than a couple of blocks from a dealer because once they get dope sick, they need to be able to get drugs within, you know, five minutes. Um, and so that's the main problem, and that's in, and the San Francisco's response has been to just allow the, the open air drug scene to continue and allow dealers to just continue to deal drugs with impunity, and it is um, the opposite of compassion. Ben, what, what do you think that analysis gets right or wrong? Well, so I think there's a couple problems with it. I mean, I think the first problem is when you think of an issue like homelessness, that is a problem that is by definition a problem of economic circumstances, not a problem of uh, something else uh, like drug use. Now, that's not to say that there aren't uh, homeless people who deal with drug use issues. There certainly are. Um, drug use is more prevalent among people who are homeless than it is among the general population. But that problem is first and foremost a problem of people not having housing. It's an economic problem. Um, and so I think when you think about the biggest safety issues that people face, one of the most important things to remember is that those are largely rooted in economic circumstances. When you look at any major city, there's massive issues of poverty and inequality in the United States that are largely rooted in people not having enough money to get by. Um, that are not really uh, a product of, of other sorts of policies and issues. I think the second issue that's a real problem is when we think about public safety and crime in the United States, and when people talk about progressive prosecutors, there's a tendency to focus on certain highly salient crimes that, uh, that are street-level crimes um, or that pertain to uh, very uh, sensationalist coverage of violent crime rather than the much broader landscape of crime and how the criminal legal system in the United States tends to, one, be extremely inhumane, um, and two, uh, target largely poor, largely black people in the United States while letting people who are rich and powerful, who often have much more harmful behaviors to society, get off with impunity. So I think when you think about the vision for a progressive prosecutor, the thing that you've got to keep in mind is a progressive prosecutor is never saying we shouldn't prosecute the, uh, some of the types of crimes that have existed in the past. They say that we should redress some of the harms caused by the way that we've prosecuted those crimes and incarcerated a lot of people in this country. And then we should also kind of rebalance the way we approach the criminal legal system such that we're focusing more on the, the types of crimes committed by the powerful that are more likely to cause problems for large numbers of people than the crimes that have typically been focused on, which tend to target people, again, who are struggling with their economic circumstances. So I suspect that Leighton wouldn't object to the idea that, uh, you know, elite 
financial crimes should be prosecuted more and with the same uh, rigorousness that low-income crimes are prosecuted, and that in fact some portion of um, criminalization of uh, kind of the certain kinds of crimes, turnstile jumping, vagrancy, things that actually don't cause a lot of harm to the public are over prosecuted. But what I'm struck by is that while I suspect there's a lot of agreement here, the, the catching point seems to be a sort of an order of operations issue. Ben, you really stress the idea that this is first a housing issue as opposed to an issue with addiction. And I wonder if we get rid of the idea of first or second, because what is, is dictating a lot of these interventions is what's available. And I think that the frustration that some leftists have is if we don't have a solution to resolve the housing issue, and frankly, we don't have much of a solution to resolve the addiction issue, why are we trying to say that it's an all or nothing approach in terms of how we approach this, instead of saying that obviously we need to build more housing and make more low income housing available at the same time that we want to make sure that people who need to get into rehabilitation services, have those services developed as well. Is, is, there, is there an issue with having that kind of approach that's a both and, Ben? No, and I, I actually think that that is typically what is recommended for solutions to the homelessness problem. Um, generally, the, the housing first approach is you make sure that people have stable housing, but you also make sure that things like treatment services are available for people who are struggling with substance abuse. Though I think the interesting thing pertaining to this conversation is the district attorney does not have a huge impact on the issue of homelessness. And so one of the things I think, again, where Leighton and I have um, been engaged in debate and talking past each other to some extent is I would say that when you're talking about the issue of homelessness, that issue only concerns the district attorney so much as the district attorney is going to prosecute crimes that are associated with homelessness and that target people who are homeless. So one of the things that Chase Aboudin ran on was a promise to stop prosecuting those crimes, which have historically been prosecuted in San Francisco and in other cities around the United States. So public camping, for example, is something that is illegal on the books. Chase Aboudin said, I'm not going to I'm not going to prosecute people for crimes like public camping. I think that that's unequivocally a good thing, because when you prosecute people for things like public camping, what you do is you cause them to interact with the police in scenarios that often involve them having to pick up and move where they are. They don't have anywhere to go. Um, they often get embroiled in the criminal legal system as a result of that, which further deteriorates their circumstances. So what I would say is when you're talking about the district attorney and homelessness, the primary thing that you're hoping the district attorney is going to do is not prosecute in the way that people who are homeless have been prosecuted many times in the past. I think the district attorney's purview actually pertains to much a, a much different set of issues, I think, than Leighton does. Now, Layton, I too, you know, like many supporters of criminal justice reform, it's not. I, I have no great desire to to cause the homeless, the mentally ill, people suffering drug addiction on the streets to have more interactions with the police. I, you know, absolutely understand and accept why that is bad, and that's you know not necessarily helpful for anyone. But if it's just, I, I suspect, and maybe this is how you feel too, that then it just defaults to, well, if nothing's being done, it's, it's not that the police are the, are the best option or maybe should even be an option in the conversation, but something needs to be done. It's not, it's not acceptable to just leave them in this condition. That's not, that's like, that doesn't seem like the humane option either. If it, maybe sticking the police on them isn't the humane option, but just leaving them as they are isn't humane either. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, well, the, the question about sticking the police on the homeless is somewhat of a straw man because really nobody is calling for that. Um, you know, you, when I um, spoke before, I, I spoke about prosecuting drug dealers, not drug users. Um, and that is has been the focus of my concern. Um, I, and that has been what the, the former DA was not doing. Um, and uh, and so the, I want to also return to Ben's point about homelessness being an economic um, issue. I don't see how you can say so um, universally that uh, homelessness by definition is an economic issue. I mean, the, the reality is that a lot of the homeless people, I, I, I don't even like to use the term homelessness because it's misleading. A lot of the homeless folks in the Tenderloin 
actually have homes. Um, I speak to the parents of a lot of these addicts in the Tenderloin every single day. Um, I've sp interviewed dozens of parents who have um, bedrooms waiting for their kids who are addicted on the street, sleeping in doorways, sleeping in tents in the Tenderloin. They have a home to go home to. Um, I, there's there's a, a, a friend of mine named Tom Wolf is a recovering addict. He owned a home, paid a mortgage in Daly City, and yet was sleeping on the street in the Tenderloin. Why? Because he could not be more than a few minutes away from a dealer when he got dope sick. So the, the, the argument that homelessness, what we call homelessness, which is people sleeping in doorways, sleeping on tents on the sidewalk, is by definition an economic issue, is just contradicted by the facts. It's just flatly untrue. But Layton, what do you do with that? So there's a young person, and again, I don't know what percentage of people who are homeless in San Francisco are in fact youth. But let's say there's a significant population of homeless youth, teens, that could go back home to their parents' house but don't want to because they're drug addicted. What is the affirmative solution to that? Because when we've discussed this on the show before, what's come out is that there aren't enough, there isn't enough support in terms of rehabilitation opportunities for people. And that the reason that the police are um, involved so frequently in these situations because folks do have the sentiment that Robbie just expressed that someone has to do something. And since we don't fund social supports, we don't fund housing, we do fund cops with a lot of these cities having a third or half of their city budgets dedicated to the police force, the police end up being naturally to fill the void the people that end up engaging with the folks. So what's your alternative proposition here? Yeah, well, this is a place where Ben and I both agree on some things and disagree on others. Um, first, uh, first of all, I think that what people who are addicted need is, is treatment, um, and they need um, treatment that is directed towards recovery. So as opposed to what San Francisco does now, which is what I call addiction maintenance, where they do harm reduction, they give you needle exchange, they give you clean foils, um, which makes no sense at all, um, give you uh, spaces where you can use drugs, um, and where there are people on hand to give you Narcan if you overdose. But there's no push towards people going into recovery. I think uh, Ben and I probably aren't that far apart on on um, on the question of the need for much more recovery services, like right now, you know, you, in order to um, get recovery, first of all, you have to be on methadone, and the methadone clinics are so understaffed that they're only open like two hours a day. Then you have to be on a three-week wait list to get a bed at least to get into recovery. That's totally unrealistic for somebody who's in the throes of addiction. Um, however, where we so there, there's a need for many more detox beds, many more recovery beds. Um, the place where I think Ben and I differ profoundly is that I believe that um, there should be a rules and an infrastructure to make that treatment mandatory, to make it mandatory to go into recovery if you are a drug addict and you are committing crimes. So not for drug addicts or who are just using drugs in the privacy of their own home, which technically is a crime, but nobody really regards it that as a, as a serious crime. But if you are shoplifting, breaking into cars in order to support your habit, you go. we need to enforce our laws. You go to court and you have a choice as to whether to go to um, prison and kick there, um, which is very unpleasant, um, or go into uh, a recovery setting where you can get on methadone, you can even get on heroin-assisted treatment, you can you you can taper off of your drugs, but that but that is not a choice. Like, but your your choice is one or the other. You can no longer continue to just live on the streets openly doing drugs. And in my opinion, that is the compassionate solution because. Then first of all, we don't have the infrastructure to do that right now, so we could not snap our fingers and make that happen. We would mm -hmm. have to build out all the, uh, the, 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 the agency and sort of the centers to be able to have that recovery available. Um, but addiction is not a choice. It's not something that you just choose to do. When you're in the throes of addiction, you have no choices. Your only choice is to continue to use drugs. So coercion, while it sounds unpleasant and it sounds like an unhappy solution, is what is necessary to free you from your chemical enslavement. Um, to pretend that just letting you continue to do drugs is giving you some sort of autonomy and free will and dignity, in my opinion, that's an illusion and it is uh, the opposite of compassion. Yeah, uh, Ben, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, so I just want to address two things briefly. So one is that when it comes to kind of determining what the, the cause of homelessness is, 
I think you can always find a handful of stories that will be edge cases. But when you look at the broad body of research and then you look at the core problem, it's generally one of people not having homes. So I do think that that's important to keep in mind just for the vast majority of people in that situation. It's an economics problem. The second piece is on the prosecution of people dealing drugs. Um, that is actually something that the district attorney's office, Chase Aboudin's office, did do. They just did it in a different way than your typical district attorney would do. Um, so they would plea out some of the cases. They would take individual circumstances into account. They would pursue more of a diversionary approach, which I tend to think is a more productive approach to crime. And I would say that takes us back to the broader point that I think I'm trying to make in this exchange, which is that when you look at what you want a progressive district attorney to accomplish. You want them to look at a criminal legal system that typically uses excessively harsh penalties and an inhumane incarceration system and try to find alternatives to that such that you're not only destroying the lives of people that you lock up, but also destroying the lives of their families and destroying whole communities. And I think the promise of a progressive prosecutor and why it's sad that Chase Boudin got recalled is because he was attempting to do that. And he had also started initiatives to overturn wrongful convictions, to go against economic crimes that are committed against people. So I just think it's really important to highlight that when you're looking at a progressive district attorney, you're looking at a vision that encompasses quite a bit more than just, for example, the drug trade. And you really want to keep in mind what are the problems with the criminal legal system and what do we actually want to address here? Well, we have to leave it there. Ben Layton, thank you to both of you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. And we'll have more rising for you after this.